Welcome to the Health, Habits, and Epic Living Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sherry Price. The goal of this podcast is to educate and enable empowered women to take the next step towards achieving their health, wellness, and lifestyle goals. Let's get started. Hey friend, before we get into today's podcast episode, I want to let you know about an amazing opportunity. I am launching Mastering Menopause. It's a four-week program where I'm going to teach you everything you need to know as a woman when you're transitioning from perimenopause into menopause, because this is a pivotal time in a woman's life. And I want you to have the knowledge on how to optimize your health, not only during this time, but to set yourself up for vibrancy and great health well into your 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. This is an important time because of our hormone imbalances that occur. And I know this leads to problematic symptoms that people tell me about. They don't like the belly fat. They don't like feeling that they're losing their cognition. They don't like feeling like they can't sleep through the night. So these are all areas we are going to cover in this program and so much more. It's all about empowering you so you have the necessary information to take the next steps to mastering this important transition time in a woman's life. To sign up, Go to epicu.com, click on the Work With Me tab, and you can sign up for the Mastering Menopause program there. I will tell you spots are limited because we're going to get to all the questions and answers during this program, so I want to keep this program small in its initial rollout. So if you're interested, please go to my website to sign up, and I can't wait to see you there. Hey, friend. I'm super excited for today's podcast episode. This is a topic I get asked a lot about, and I know a lot of women struggle in this area. And what we're going to talk about today are five key ways that you can banish belly fat. So earlier this week, I gave a presentation called Health Habits, Hormones, and Happiness to a group of about 50 women. And in the room in front of me were mostly women that are in the second half of their life, the best half, as I like to call it. And I was talking about how to take care of our body because our hormones signal everything, what our body does. Our hormones tell us when we're hungry, when we're not. It'll signal libido. It'll signal all kinds of things going on, right? And so to have optimal health, right, we have to be concerned about our habits. We have to be concerned and know how our hormones work. And of course, all of this leads to happiness. Well, the room was just in an uproar. Everybody was so excited. After my talk, they wanted to learn more about mastering menopause, mastering their hormones, mastering this second phase, which I call the best phase of our life, right? In that first phase of our life, that first 40 years, we are achieving and getting and having the kids and working up the career ladder. And in the second phase, we get to enjoy all the fruits of our labor. And so we get to really enjoy being with all the things that we've created, made, and celebrate all those successes. And in the second half of life, I believe we should really be optimizing our health, right? We want to hang on to our health as long as we can. So I am launching Mastering Menopause. This will be a four-week program designed for women in midlife who really want to optimize their health. They really want to optimize their habits. They want to understand how hormones work. If they have problematic symptoms because of menopause, I want to help them tackle how to resolve that, how to get rid of them. Because if we could get rid of them, why wouldn't we? And I say all the time, and in my presentation the other night was, menopause is not just about hormones, meaning hot flashes, night sweats, and vaginal dryness. There are 98 symptoms that can happen when you go through this change in life, and not all of them come at once. So I really want to help you understand what's going on in your body, work with your body to optimize your health in this best half of your life. So if you're interested, you can check this program out on my website at epicu.com and then just go under the work with me page and you will see Mastering Menopause there. So super excited to bring this information to you. I already have a couple of signups from that talk and I've 
been asked to give another talk about that to another group of women. So I'm super excited for this. I do want to let you know, since it's the initial phase and the initial rollout of this program, I will be limiting the spots to 20. So some are already taken. So if you are serious about learning this information and want a great format where you can learn this information, ask questions on our calls, please go and join up now because I know this program will fill up, particularly when I give my next talk. I'm sure the audience will be excited. So if you're interested, check that out. All right, so jumping into five ways to banish belly fat. And why I want to talk about belly fat is because it is the layman term that I use or the you know common term I use to talk really about visceral fat. And I've talked about on this podcast before how visceral fat of the types of fat that we can have on our body is the most dangerous. It is the one that sets us up for all kinds of chronic illness from dementia to Alzheimer's to cardiovascular disease to stroke. And what do women die from? What is the number one cause of death in the United States for the woman? It is cardiovascular disease. It is not breast cancer. It is not these other things that, yes, we fear and, yes, can affect us, but it really is cardiovascular disease. And what do we know about cardiovascular disease? We know that it is disease of inflammation absolutely a disease of inflammation. So anything we can do to reduce the inflammatory burden on our body is going to set us up for better cardiovascular health. And what does visceral fat do? It causes inflammatory cytokines to be released in our body. This is why it's critical that we look at our visceral fat. We can measure our visceral fat. We should know what that is, right? And so there are certain parameters we can look at. I talked about a few of them on the podcast in previous episodes and really understand that it's dangerous. It's not just from a cosmetic standpoint. Of course, we don't like cellulite and fat. We want to banish that from a cosmetic standpoint, but it's from a health standpoint. And so I'm super passionate about helping women banish that belly fat because I know By doing that, you're adding years to your life. Not only that, you're adding quality years to your life because you feel better. You can move easier, right? And you're not just feeling sluggish. And what do all those inflammatory cytokines do? They also give us joint pain. They give us a lot of other symptoms before we get the full-blown heart attack or the full-blown dementia diagnosis. So anything we can be doing to reduce that is super important. And I think banishing belly fat is key in that process because that visceral fat is secreting inflammatory cytokines. And that is why it's important. So when I say banish belly fat, I want to come back to a concept I talked about in a previous podcast is this TOFI, right? Thin on the outside, fat on the inside, meaning there's visceral fat maybe around the organs, but it's just not showing in terms of somebody's waistline. And I bring this up because just last week I was meeting with some women and one of the women was saying that she has prediabetes. Now, this woman, if you looked at her from the outside, she is thin. She is really thin, tall, slender, skinny. And she was shocked because she had thought that prediabetes and diabetes only happen when you're sedentary, don't follow a good diet, and then develop some weight gain. And she really doesn't have a lot of weight on her body, yet she has prediabetes. So as we were discussing, I said, would you like help around that? What are you doing around that? I'd love to support you. And so we got into some of the things that she was doing that was leading to prediabetes. And nobody had ever explained this information to her. So I'm just so passionate about this because this is our health, ladies. If we don't have our health, We can't even focus on anything else, right? That's all we focus on is getting that health back. So it's not just looking at body type because sometimes you don't know if you have visceral fat. Like she didn't know because she didn't see it on her body. It was around her organs and in her organs and the like. So visceral fat leaks inflammatory cytokines, like I said, which travel to the body and give us all kinds of later chronic conditions non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It could give us dysbiosis, SIBO, kinds of gut disorders. And then I mentioned the big ones at the start of this podcast. So inflammatory cytokines, what do they do? 
right? Why are they so dangerous? Well, they set up hormonal changes in our body, which lead to metabolic changes in our body. And so we're getting more inflammation and this visceral fat continues to grow. And then guess what? We start putting on more visceral fat because of the hormone changes. Visceral fat will secrete cortisol. Cortisol in the belly region, right? That visceral fat or that belly fat has more cortisol receptors, which means then it's more sensitive to the cortisol and will grow quicker. So it's a type of fat that if we don't control it, it could get out of hand and cause more damage to our health. So it leads to hormonal imbalances, like I mentioned, metabolic dysfunction, and also can lead to weight gain and then further complications from that. So visceral fat or belly fat drives inflammation, and that inflammation drives chronic diseases of many kind, which will affect our health span as well as our lifespan. So taking away the years that we have of health and then shortening our years of life. All right, so let's get into the top ways that we can banish belly fat. I really want to help you do this because it is so important for your health and overall well-being. So tip number one is to stop eating ultra-processed foods. Okay, so this is huge, right? We know that the stats out there, 70% of our diet for the average American comes from ultra processed foods. 70%, my friend, 70%. So you can, instead of just being 30%, right, of eating good food, good food that's good for you, the nice whole foods, if we can increase the amount of whole foods that you eat and lessen the ultra processed foods, right, we're going to change that balance and we're going to promote fat loss, right? Because we want to banish that belly fat. So we want to make sure that we're looking for those refined starches, extra sugar, salt, bad fat, right? There's healthy fat and then there's fat that's not healthy. So cutting out the bad fat from our diet. And a lot of times these ultra processed foods have that perfect combination that I talked about in a previous podcast about the bliss point where it tells the brain to overconsume. Oh, this is so good. Just keep eating those Oreos. This is so good. Oh, just keep eating those Cheetos. Oh, this is so good. Just keep eating those Doritos, right? They are designed to be addictive, which means we will overconsume them, which means we won't really get satiated or be full and we will just keep eating and eating and eating. And these calories are empty. They are not full of nutrients that the body needs. Right? They're not full of the amino acids. They are not full of phytonutrients. They are not full of fiber. They are devoid of that. And that is what the body needs for maintaining a healthy homeostasis, maintaining health so that we get those hormones secreted like they should be. Hormone balance rather than hormone dysregulation. So ultra processed foods will mean that we put weight on right? That will start to cause the visceral fat to come on. And it is the number one reason attributed to why we have an obesity and diabetes epidemic in our country. It is the number one reason that we are seeing worsening of our health. And even mental health disorders are on the rise, right? And postulating that there is that causative relationship to ultra-processed foods and how our brains don't do well on these foods, especially if we're consuming 70% of our diet is made up of ultra-processed foods. So just limiting that can help our brains and our bodies so much. So minimize or eliminate the ultra-processed foods in order to banish belly fat. So I want to end this part saying what you eat matters. I know a lot of times we'll just sit down and we're just hungry and we don't think about what we're eating or we're just time constricted or other things. And we are not really looking at the quality and the type of food that we're eating. And that is imperative that we get really knowledgeable in this area. Cause once you have that knowledge, once you know how to construct a meal, <laughs> right? You will have that knowledge with you for the rest of your life. 
And I think that is the one of the most important things we can learn on how to take care of our bodies. Self-care starts in the kitchen. Absolutely. And so what you eat matters. And that's why I'm such an advocate of intermittent fasting. So you learn what, when, how, where, all the things that matter to set you up for hormonal balances, which means happiness, which means you feel good, which means you're at your normal weight, which means you're operating in a health environment inside and out. So stop eating ultra processed foods is the first way and probably one of the most important ways to banish belly fat. All right, moving on to way number two is to get moving. Stop being so sedentary. We have a lifestyle now where we don't have to move that much. We don't have to go out that much. We have so many conveniences. We can just open an app, add our groceries to the cart, and hit order, deliver, right? We can have food delivered to us. We don't have to go out, procure it, and make it, and cook it, and all of that. That can all be done so easily now. Our work environments have changed, right? We're not out in the fields or in the farms for a lot of us. We are at a desk staring into a screen for eight hours or more a day, right? We're not getting in the proper amount of movement. So this is not even just exercise, which that is important, but I'm even speaking just movement in general. We know that the new cliche, right, is sitting is the new smoking because we know sitting for a long period of time is leading us to have death quicker, right? It's killing us. It literally is killing us. And so I really want to put it that way because it's the truth. And if we know that it's harming us, we know that we can do something about it, which is, means that we get up and move more often. So if you're sitting for a period of time, if you're sitting for 45 minutes, get up and take a five-minute walk. Walk around your house. I walk up and down my steps all the time. I love walking up and down my steps. As long as my knees and my health allows it, I want to keep walking up and down my steps. Sometimes I make more errands just to go up and down my steps. If I could carry two things and I'm like, oh, I can do it in one trip, sometimes I'm like, no, I'll do another trip because I want more movement throughout my day. I sit a lot, right? I'm on computers. I'm helping clients over Zoom. I'm podcasting here for my podcast and for other podcasts. I know I'm sitting. And so I want to counteract that with movement throughout my day. I do exercise snacks, right, to get that in because it's important to take care of your health. So did you know that sitting slows a lot of things down? So when you're sitting, you don't utilize the sugar that you're eating. If you're up and moving, your muscles contract and they pull that sugar out of the blood and they utilize it. So you're less likely to have that sugar stored by insulin and put into a fat cell, right? So I like to move, particularly right after I eat, to start utilizing that glucose, start pulling it out of my blood and start using it so I'm not going to store it as fat. So movement causes that muscle contraction, so just move. I'm not talking like you have to like do the gym three times a day. I'm not saying that. I'm saying movement is actually moving the blood right into the muscle and the muscle utilizes it and then it's used up and it's gone. That way I'm not in fat storage, I'm in fat burning mode. Sitting also causes us to lose flexibility, right? When I sit for long periods of time, I'll feel it in my hips. Some people will say they feel it in their low back, right? Because what we don't use, we lose. My hamstrings can get tight from sitting long periods of time, so we want to keep that range of motion as we age. We want to keep making sure that we're doing range of motion activities that could be stretching, you know, that could be pushing back your shoulders. Things I do when I hunch over a computer, I want to counteract that and pull my shoulders back and do some exercises so I'm not walking like a cane. And so it's very important to make sure you get movement in for flexibility and mobility and range of motion. Sitting also means that we shallow breathe a lot. We're not utilizing our entire lung capacity, right? Because we don't really need to be utilizing our lung capacity when we're not really exercising or not really moving. Now, if you take a break from the gym or take a break from exercise, do you notice that you'll huff and puff more? 
Do you notice that if you, like me, take, a say, a month off from exercise and then you go back to it, it's like, wow, I didn't maintain it. I actually lost ground. And now I'm huffing and puffing and sometimes my lungs burn and they hurt because I'm not used to that cardiorespiratory that I was utilizing in the past. And so I lost that capacity. So I'm thinking as I do this, I'm like, wow, I lost that capacity. And now it's my opportunity to get it back. It's my opportunity to grow back that capacity. And so doing that cardio respiratory exercise is really important. It's important for our lung function to make sure we're utilizing all of our lung capacity because if we don't use it, ladies, what happens? We lose it. Another reason you want to keep moving is because your muscles, if you're not utilizing your muscles, you start to lose muscle mass. And if you keep losing muscle mass, right, that's a condition known as sarcopenia. So we're losing muscle mass and what gets replaced? Fat mass. We lose muscle, we get fat, right? So losing our muscles leads to sarcopenia. Sarcopenia means we can also lose our bone mass, right? If we're not building muscles and we're not doing strength training, we're not going to have the effect that our bones need to really build them up and keep them from getting osteoporotic and frail and easily to break. So we become more prone to falls and fractures and we don't want that, right? We want to prevent that. So utilizing our muscle is also helping making our bones strong. Also, we know that there's a direct correlation. When you sit more, you increase visceral fat. So you increase belly fat, right? For many reasons we just talked about. We're not utilizing the glucose. Our insulin is elevated because we have more glucose to store. That gets stored as belly fat and visceral fat. And so again, that leads to more of that belly fat. So bottom line, get in a lot of movement throughout the day. And don't think of it as just the gym, right? Even if you just do the gym one hour and sit the remaining 23 hours, that's not enough. So park far away from the grocery store and walk. You know, walk around your house, walk around your block, walk around your neighborhood, right? Get in movement. And I love the concept of doing exercise snacks. So bottom line, movement matters. And the type of movement also matters. And I love Dr. Huberman. He does great podcasts on talking about movement and how it helps the overall body. It helps restore our hormone functions. You know, when you move or when you exercise, don't you sleep better? Like my sleep is always better when I exercise. So it just goes to show you it resets all of our hormones and really works that we function and feel amazing when we get in movement. So the type of movement as well as frequency of movement, both are important, type as well as frequency, right? So just one hour a day may not be enough depending on your goals and just getting in also movement throughout the day, super important. All right, third way to banish belly fat, find healthy ways to reduce stress. So healthy ways. There's a lot of unhealthy ways to reduce stress. One of those being drinking alcohol, right? But find healthy ways to reduce stress. And here's why. For most people, stress in our modern day society is psychological, right? We're thinking about work. We're thinking about all the things. We're thinking about our finances, right? We're thinking. So it's a lot of mental or psychological stress. And thinking about it in a stressful way will increase our cortisol. And we know this, right? And we talked about how when you increase cortisol, that will cause an increase in belly fat. Cortisol is our stress hormone, and it is meant to rise and fall with acute stress. However, in modern day society, we are met with a lot of chronic stress from overthinking, from thinking about all the things that we have to do. That leads to chronic stress, which means we have elevated cortisol throughout the day. And that's going to lead to fat accumulation. So cortisol, we talked about why it particularly is dangerous. Not only does it lead to visceral fat and that belly fat, but then that belly fat will have more cortisol receptors, 40% more cortisol receptors than other types of fat. So more receptors, 
So when the cortisol is there and it binds to these receptors, what happens? Belly fat grows. So cortisol becomes really dangerous when it's high in terms of belly fat, inflammation, and weight gain. Also, if you are a woman and you are transitioning into perimenopause and menopause, what happens in perimenopause and menopause is our estrogen levels start to decline. And when they start to decline, naturally, the counterbalance to that is cortisol starts to rise. And this is why as you progress into your 40s and 50s and 60s, you become more sensitive to stress. You become less stress resilient. So you become more um, sensitive to stress, which means you will build more cortisol. And as that estrogen continues to come down and come down and come down and come down as you hit menopause, your cortisol will continue to rise and rise and rise. That's biology. And so if we know that is happening as we age, it becomes more imperative to have a stress reduction practice, a cortisol reduction practice. And in my mind, it is not a luxury and it's not optional. It is mandatory as you get north of 40. Because if you do not, you are not going to be counteracting the effects of cortisol and the belly fat. So that's why number three, you must find healthy ways to reduce stress. You can say manage stress, but I really want you to reduce stress, not just manage it, but reduce stress. So women are more prone to stress. We are more prone to stress than our male counterparts. And as I mentioned, as we age, we become more prone to stress just because we are secreting more cortisol and we are secreting less estrogen. So when you add the mental stress that women undergo, we've got older family members to take care of. We've got the young family members, maybe that are out of the house, but we're still caring for them. And we've got financial pressures and we got all the things that life throws at us. Of course, if we're not taking care of our stress level, it's going to lead to visceral fat and that belly fat. So notice your life stressors. Notice where you feel like life gets too overwhelming. And counteract that with some healthy ways to reduce stress. Again, I find this to be mandatory and not optional. I have helped a client last year, actually. She was putting on belly fat, belly fat, belly fat, doing all the things. She says, I'm eating less and moving more. You know, the whole campaign, eat less, move more, which by the way, doesn't work for many women. It doesn't. Because when you eat too little, guess what? That's a stress on your body. And then your body's like, I'm not getting the right calories. I'm not getting the right nutrients. I'm not getting enough food. I'm chronically hungry. And now you're going to the gym five days a week. And that's a form of stress for the body is over-exercising when you're undernourished. So just eating less and moving more fails for most people. And that was the protocol that she was doing. I'm eating less. I'm two meals a day. And I'm exercising five days a week and I can't seem to get rid of this fat. And the weight just keeps coming on. And I've got stress at work and stress for my kids and la la. We just implemented some stress reduction practices and had her eat more. Guess what? She lost 10 pounds super quick because she regulated her hormones. She regulated her body. Her body was in dysregulation. When your body's in dysregulation, it's not going to feel safe to lose the weight and you're not setting it up to lose the weight. You're not doing the right things. So we can overdo some of these too, which can turn into a stress of the body. So it's finding the right balance. Okay. So as I really began to understand how this was affecting people, right? I have a whole program inside of Epic U, a whole program inside of Tone in 10, right? We really nail this home because I think a lot of women just think it's optional. And it is not optional if you want to banish belly fat. It is very, very important. And you will see the results. You will see the results. And you know what? You'll be like, wow, I'm actually enjoying losing weight because I get to do stress reduction. And who wants more stress in their life? No one, <laughs> right? We want less. And that makes you feel good. And that sets your hormones upright. And then you start banishing the belly fat. Okay, so bottom line, make sure you have several 
stress reduction practices. Several. And these should be daily. Some of them need to be daily. I see a lot of women who will come to me and say, well, I get a massage once a month, or even if you get a massage once a week, that's not enough. And some people don't even find that to be stress reducing. Some people do, some people don't, right? So finding those key things that work for your lifestyle, they fit into your budget because a lot of things you can do are free. And so cost is not an issue in this category. I teach my clients all the time many ways that they can reduce stress that are free. It's just making sure that you do it. And that is key. Okay. So moving on to way number four to banish belly fat is to get great sleep. (laughs) Great. So I'm sure you will all agree with me that not all sleep is created equal. Just like not all food is created equal, right? Some food is crap. Some food is good for you. Just like some nights you sleep, it's crap. (laughs) Sometimes you sleep and it's amazing. So getting that high quality or great sleep in is going to regulate your hormones. By far, it's one of the best ways to regulate your hormones, particularly as you age. So getting enough quality sleep will decrease the risk of overeating. Because just think about when you don't get high quality sleep, when you feel groggy in the morning. What do you tend to do? You tend to overeat. You tend to choose the wrong foods. We tend to have cravings that will take us to bad carbs and sugar and caffeine, and we'll start over consuming these. And then we won't feel good, and it sets us up for poor choices later on in the day. In 2022, there was a crossover study that found that sleep deprived individuals ate about 300 more calories. And the type of calories they ate were mostly carbs and sugar. They ate 300 more calories per day and gained more body fat than their well-rested counterparts. And when they looked at the type of weight that was gained in that study, they found the type of weight that was gained was visceral fat or belly fat. So poor sleep, you notice, will also oftentimes go along with poor food choices And that duo really sets you up to accumulate belly fat quicker. All right, moving on to the last strategy to reduce belly fat. And this is one of my favorites is to limit alcohol. Yes, (laughs) limit alcohol because we know that alcohol, there is a dose dependent relationship between the amount of alcohol you consume and the amount of belly fat or the amount of visceral fat. So the more alcohol that's consumed, the higher the amount of belly fat, right? We even call it a beer belly on males usually, right? So there is that dose relationship. Why? Because alcohol is a metabolic disruptor, right? It's going to turn off and dysregulate a lot of our hormones and a lot of what goes on for us metabolically. So it creates this negative metabolic effect on the body So the more you drink, the more it burdens your metabolism, right? So you can't metabolize the food because your liver is focusing on metabolizing the alcohol because we know it's a toxin. The body knows it's a toxin. It takes a priori for the liver. It works on breaking that down and it ignores the food for the time being. And if the food stays there too long, some of it will get metabolized. But if we don't need that energy source, what do we do? We store it as fat. It also is a major hormone disruptor. You know that because alcohol affects our sleep, right? It affects how we metabolize our food and it affects our brain. It affects our liver for the negative impacts. So many negative impacts metabolically that come from consuming a lot of alcohol and it will impair fat metabolism. So it leads to us depositing fats in and around our liver, which is why it leads to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or alcoholic fatty liver disease, right? And it can contribute to both. So looking at alcohol, right? The quantity matters. So when we say, oh, one more drink won't hurt, that's definitely a lie. One more drink will hurt the body, right? So I always like to 
look at how much alcohol is consumed on a daily basis, look at how much alcohol is consumed on a weekly basis, and try to get those numbers down because that's going to benefit your body, your brain, your liver, your gut health, your banishing your belly fat, and so much more. Such great things come from reducing the toxic load and the stress because alcohol is seen as a stress by the body right? It's high alert. Like all the alarm bells go off saying, oh my gosh, here's alcohol. We need to process it right away because it's a toxin. If we don't, the body can die, (laughs) right? So it's in there. It's like high alert. So that's a massive stress on the body. And a lot of people think of it as I did, the way to de-stress, okay? So we might feel good in the moment, but it's really a major stress on the body. So look for healthy ways to de-stress the body. And drinking Copious amounts of alcohol is not a healthy way to distress. Okay, so I know many of you had asked me to do this topic on banishing belly fat. When I started my free Facebook group, Health Habits and Epic Living, a lot of people were saying, I want to learn ways to lose weight. I want to learn ways to banish belly fat. And so I thought this would be an awesome time to share this information with you so that you can banish the belly fat, get healthier, feel better in your body, be fit, be slim and really set yourself up for great health in the second half of your life and not give your body all the disease, all the inflammation that comes from visceral fat. So as I close this podcast episode, I just want to say one thing that totally fascinates me and it's fascinated me since I was a teenager is the biology of the body. I just think it's so amazing that we can mistreat our body for a period of time But that when you come back to doing the right things, that the body is malleable, that the body changes, that the body responds to exactly what we do. The brain changes, right? I talk a lot about that on this podcast, on how the brain can change and neuroplasticity and how we didn't know that information 50 years ago. Now we have that information. And it's amazing how we can get back into homeostasis with our body, how our body wants to return to health. How do we know it wants to return to health? Because when you start doing healthy things for your body, don't you feel better? When you go to the gym, you may not feel great going to the gym, but when you're done with that exercise, don't you feel amazing? You get a sense of accomplishment. You get the dopamine hit. You get the flood of endorphins. Your body is basically signaling back to you, I want more of this, do more of this. Right? We don't feel good when we overeat. We feel good when we eat good quality food that our cells need for nourishment. And then we feel satisfied. We feel content. Those are the feelings that come when we do the actions that are healthy for our body. And so I'm always fascinated how our bodies talk to us, how they tell us, yeah, that felt really good. Keep doing that. Right? And if you drink alcohol, you might think, oh, that feels really good. But the next day, do you feel really good? Do you get really good sleep? Does it really set you up for a great next day? It doesn't. So your body is telling you what it wants, what it likes, what it needs. And if we just listen to that and do the right actions, we get to maintain wonderful health. I want to leave you with something I had heard on one of the podcasts I was watching, and I found it fascinating and really true. I'm not going to say it exactly as the person said it, but it was something of the nature of a person with their health has a thousand priorities versus a person who doesn't have their health. Maybe they're stricken with a cancer diagnosis or something. They have one priority, and that one priority is to get their health back. And I share that with you because it is important. Our health is the most important thing. It's the most important thing for us to enjoy our life and to be able to give to the world, right? And so I want to set you up for success to really do these five key tools to banish belly fat and have the health you want. All right, my friend, thank you for joining me today and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Health Habits and Epic Living Podcast. If you're ready to take the next step to improve your health, wellness, and lifestyle goals, head over to www.epicu.com and sign up for my weekly newsletter. Again, that's E-P-I-C-Y-O-U.com. Please note that the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice.